We're really glad to be here. This is um, Bob Browner and Michelle Wells are really going to give you the nuts and bolts of the programs that we did. I want to tell you just a little bit about Lincoln Club Schools. This is my sixth year as superintendent, and uh, we're 40,000 students. We are a uh, pretty high performing district and uh, a school district that really is pretty progressive. And one of the things that I believe make us or give us an opportunity to be progressive is we have tremendous partnerships in our community and around our state. And I know that in a lot of districts around America, we talk about this a lot, it's difficult to create community partnerships. And, and probably the underlying reason for that is just that we are protectionists in education. And we sometimes don't want to open up the doors for community folks to come in with great ideas and can, can actually, in Dr. Rauner's case, be able to, to put out a, a, a theory and a thesis and then back it up with data um, that really make, give us an opportunity to make a difference in the lives of our kids through health and wellness. And we, you'll see some data here I think you'd be very impressive uh, with. But things that, uh, that stick out to us, and Amy was telling me, and this is exciting, you have full service community learning centers or community schools. We do as well. 26 of our schools are titled. So we have the four and after school programs. We're working on our clinics. We do a lot of our after school, hopefully we can focus on wellness, academic, social, emotional, those kinds of things. We have early childhood for just about everybody. Our state is, has begun to fund that a little bit more. Uh, we have a technology plan that uh, is going to have a device <coughs> that's out there for Google Chrome uh, in the next two or three years. We just opened a state-of-the-art uh, career academy with 14 pathways, and one of them is um, uh, dietetics and, and uh, uh, nutrition, and we've got a lot of great interest in that. Um, and that's, that's a partnership with our, with our city and it's based on the hot jobs, the hot jobs in Lincoln and the hot jobs in the Midwest. And our kids now are beginning to get internships. And um, in fact, we've had three, three of our seniors that have already been hired by some of our companies. We're a, kind of a startup, a technology startup city. And um, there's just a, a lot of great opportunities for kids there. So we talked about a little bit about health and wellness. You know, overall, you know, we focus on our health and wellness. We've taken that as a district priority. When Dr. Rauner came in, and introduced himself to me, um, and, he, and he showed me our obesity rates in Lincoln, which were kind of shocking to me at the time. I thought we need to do something about that. But you know, how do you do something about like that in an environment where we have so many things imposed upon us, and it's one more program? Somebody in your district is saying one more program we don't have time to do because we got to focus on you know the Common Core, your Common Core state, right? Um, so what, what we ended up doing in our school district and what was happening prior to my arrival, we were decreasing recess and PE time because we needed to get kids up to academic standards. So our overarching goal, just like your overarching goal, is student achievement, graduation rates, which by the way, we graduated about 87% of our kids on time in Lincoln. And over the last five years, that's gone from 78 to 87. And I would give a, a, a great deal of credit to this partnership because we are really trying to build better kids, better people, as early as possible to the interventions that we have. And so, um, so we were looking for strategies. Well, has anybody heard of Jamie Ballmer? Has he made the rounds up here? And he, he's, uh, Jamie is a, a, a gentleman who owned a ice cream company in Iowa and very successful business person. I think he was originally from Philadelphia. And they were making a lot of money. They had the best blueberry ice cream in the country. And um, you know the story. The story really is he was asked by the governor to sit on an ad hoc committee and to, uh, to make schools more like businesses. Sick and tired of putting all this money in that goes, you know, just blankets the education profession and we don't get any results. All we get is excuses. So he brought in all these business people. Jamie, I think, was maybe the chair of that. And they came up with recommendations on how to make schools more like business. Well, we hear that if you're around as long as I've been, and I, I know uh, Dr. Flowers pretty well. We started our careers together in uh, Kansas, young guys. Um, we've heard this many, many times. There's going to be another political cycle that's the case. So what Jamie did was he offered to be the spokesperson. So he travels Iowa, and he's given his message about you've got to get, you, you, we've got to be more like a business. It's a bottom line. Money in. Results here. We don't get it. Get rid of the people that aren't getting the job done. And he he get paid 200, 300 bucks, and he would tick off all these faculties across Iowa. And he loved it. He's he's just a very uh, personable guy. 
And then one day, he was talking about blueberries, and he was using his business. He says, we make the best blueberry ice cream in the world because we use nothing but the very best blueberries. And when he was done, he was getting hissed and booed, and, and guys checked, and he was walking out a kindergarten teacher. I was talking about kindergarten teachers over there. He, 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 he describes him as near retiring kindergarten teacher. He said, uh, Mr. Bonner, what do you do with the blueberries that don't meet your standards? And he changed that day. I mean, that's the basis of his book. He's got a video out there. I'd encourage you to go get his book. It's called Schools Cannot Do It Alone. And he talks about all of the things. And the, and the reason why we're not a business is all of the requirements that society and our local communities, whether it's the federal or the state, have put into school curriculums over the years to solve social that's the little warble I, I, I just borrowed it from Jamie. There are literally more than 100 programs since the 1960s that schools have been asked to do while raising student achievement, increasing the graduation rate, spending less money when times are tough, and still doing it with the same amount of time that they had when schools were founded back and so we never add any time, we just keep adding more programs. And so one of the messages that I want you to take from that is that while we embrace these responsibilities and we see why drug and alcohol education, comprehensive sex education, whatever the issue is, driver's education, you know, uh, breakfast, school breakfast, all day kindergarten, now it's going to be all day early childhood. We see the importance of all that. The bottom line, and I give Volmer all credit for all for this, because he's taking this message nationally, is that we can't do it alone. And so rather than being the recipient of solve obesity, you know, your kids are your kids are not well and your staff's not well, and you know, don't make the excuse that you have to cut PE and recess because you don't have time in the schedule. Go to your community and see if you can. So that sets the stage for Dr. Bob Rahner, who I had the pleasure of meeting, I think, within the first 30 days. He targeted me <coughs> um, as the new superintendent that might not uh, have figured much out. But I remember that conversation extremely well because what he offered was an opportunity for a partnership that wasn't going to cost a lot of money, if anything. We didn't know where it was going to go. You're going to hear kind of that, uh, that, that uh, evolution of how it all came together in Lincoln Public School. But I can tell you. Once or twice a year, when Bob and Michelle present our board, our board is just over the top impressed with what's happening to our student obesity rates, which, by the way, we think is leading to greater student attendance and certainly greater student achievement. I think our staff is healthier. I contribute as much as I can. We all have to be role models if we're going to model good behavior. I mean, I was looking for bacon and eggs this morning, but <laughs> yogurt, great substitute. I'm a three-story three building. We have elevators. I, I love tormenting people who take elevators when they should be taking the stairs. And I think we've changed some behaviors. If they see me coming, they definitely won't take the elevator. But I can tell you that will make a big difference in the lives of kids. Particularly those kids in poverty that don't have the ability to eat nutritious. So I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Ryan. start with a good slide. So I, I, I serve in kind of like sort of an outside data evaluator role. I'm, I'm not in LPS. I'm the guy from the outside asking them to do stuff. Uh, this is my favorite slide in my last five years, essentially, because this is kind of our results that we've gotten. And it didn't come after a year. So one thing is patience. Uh, it took seven to eight years to get to this point. But we're at the point now where we, we literally have the data to back up that our kids are becoming less, less obese and they're becoming more fit. Um, this is a slide, this is actually kids at the climbing wall, and you know, that can work perfect for the slides. It's going to reach that point that it's going to be great. I'm going to show that picture, that's why I should do it. I'm actually very sorry to talk about the picture earlier. So. So, so how did this, some of this come about? And, um, so sometimes I talk about well, why I'm a family doc originally. I started out in a rural, as a rural family doc originally, then moved back to Lincoln because my wife was from there. Uh, how did I get involved in this stuff? What, what possessed me to do, do that and do what I do? Uh, this 
slide is kind of a backdrop. What this slide is, this is the millions of people with diabetes in the United States. Okay? And I did my medical training here. And then my wife and I, uh, she's a family doctor too, went back to my hometown in Western Nebraska. We practiced medicine here. We did that for about five years. We came back to the exact same clinic we did our training at five years later. And it was, it was enough time to see a big difference. And when we came back in 2003, in that clinic, I could say, where did, all, where did all these diabetics come from? We didn't have those there, you know, seven, eight years ago. What was happening? We needed a little longer. Do you know what mic number you have? <laughs> Sorry, everybody. Five. Uh, I'm so How's that? Is that better? <coughs> you got to hold it closer. Oh, that All right, okay. There we go. Thank you. I'll just hold it. So anyway, <clears throat> so I saw this and I started looking into this. Why are, we, why are we having so many diabetics? If you could put a slide of obesity prevalence in the United States, it would mirror that exactly. And so it's about obesity. It's a lack of fitness. People are obese. That's why they had to rename what we used to call adult onset diabetes. It's now called type 2 because kids get it now. That didn't happen when I started medical school. So I started trying to do stuff in my clinic. I started working with the kids. He has started as early as possible. You guys all know that. And so I started doing some things, and unfortunately, it wasn't working very well. Uh, I remember one day I was talking to a little Hispanic boy, third grader, and I was working on my motivational interviewing techniques. And I said, what do you like to do to be active? What do you like to do during recess? And he turned around and looked at me, and he said, we don't have recess at my school. And I thought, oh, you're kidding me. And his older brother chimed in, and he said, no, they got rid of recess at that school two years ago. And I thought, well, that's crazy. How can, how can we do this if there's no, the kids literally have no recess anymore? Um, and then about three months later, uh, this is my daughter Natalie when she was in kindergarten. I pull out her Friday folder, the My Coke Rewards brochure to raise money for your school. I thought, well, geez, this isn't going to work. They're trying to get the kids to drink pop to raise money for the school. There's no recess. I'm not going to do much in my clinic one kid at a time. And that's what prompted me. And I think you, you probably know the folks run for the school board because something motivated them. They got involved in the school because something motivated them. That, that was my motivation to get involved in the schools. And I actually went back. After this, that's when I went back and got my master's. I went out to do it right because I'm a really analytic person. I don't just do it off the cuff. I go overboard sometimes on data, which uh, we'll talk about that maybe at the breakout. <laughs> and so I then started trying to work with the schools. And I hit some of those barriers and brick walls, and people just listened to me until I could get out the door. But I started finding some people who were receptive and, and got it and also interested. And so as an outsider, trying to find those people at the school who are willing to think about some solutions. And these are the first five people that helped me out. Uh, Mary Bell is our, uh, uh, was our health and key curriculum uh, person uh, who just retired this year. Uh, Richard McGinnis was a guy in the school board who kind of got it and helped us get our first data because we couldn't get data services to give us any data for our pet grant, which brought money, which was one of our Kickstarter things. Uh, Judy Zabel was our uh, head of nursing. Uh, Jesse Coffey worked in nutrition. And then, right as we were just getting started this, this guy named Steve Joel started. And I came with a presentation. He said, Dad, yeah, that makes sense. Let's do it. And without these folks, I could not have done any of this as an outsider. And it's really, so what we're, some things we're going to talk about in the breakout is, is that outsider versus insider working with the schools. Because I think what Dr. Joel told you is just really important. How does that work within the community? So what did we do? Over the course of years, we did things. We got rid of, we did reinstitute recess in all schools again and a physical activity break. We started working on these junk food rewards, fundraisers on Friday afternoon, the pop promotions, school lunches. Part of that was some of the, some of the school lunch guidelines that came down. But we did, we've been doing other things. And I think one of the biggest things was this wellness coordinator and health challenge, <coughs> bringing Michelle. And that was one of those proposals where I came to Steve and said, if we could get the money for this, can we do it? And he said, yes. And that's, then we were off to the races. And then well, Michelle will talk a little about here, and she does it, and she does it in a positive way. It's fun. It's not, it's not the health Nazi approach. That doesn't work. Um, and then I had to get buy-in from other folks, like the community and the school board. What do they want to hear? They want to hear about academic testing scores. And one of the things we did is we rolled into our data, not just obesity and not just fitness, but we pulled in the math and the reading scores and the ethnicity and all kinds of different things and found out that the kids who are physically fit do better on all the, set, all the tests, reading, math, science, uh, or writing tests are showing the same results. And when I could come to the school board and show this, that raised some eyebrows. When I go to the business community, they get this. And so out in the community, this is something that speaks to people. And so it's not just about wellness. You have to tie it in, feel, figure out how does it work for everybody. This is good all around for everything from even behavior issues, for example. 
Um, so we made our targets. We, we, had, we set a target in 2010 to get to this X by 2015, and we reached it. So now we're, doing, uh, we're actually going to try to get a different target by 2020. Uh, and we're focusing more on fitness, too, because actually it turns out that obesity is important, but fitness is probably more important. Uh, and we can talk about that later. Um, and I have to turn them as, as some into numbers. One of the things we're getting in the obesity literature is we're getting what does that really cost in terms of long-term dollars. Uh, if we meet our target by 2020, we're halfway there already, by the way, we'll save $19,000 per kid. That saves about $25 million in direct medical costs, just from that alone. And the employers, I'm taking this message to employers in town to realize that you guys need to support this because it's going to save you money. Uh, and also for the schools, that's their biggest competition for funding is, is, is health funding. So, so how are we going to get there? This is kind of an interesting slide. This is uh, how, what, the percentage of kids that were obese when we started in 2010. That's this blue line. Red line is where we were last year, that we're actually getting the kids less obese, and it's happening in school age. And I've argued that this actually helps to prove that it's what we're doing in the schools. If it was happening across the community, you'd see this number going down too. This hasn't budged. They're still showing up to school the same amount of obese. It's what's happening in the schools that's preventing this. And so we, what you are doing in the schools can fix this. And the evidence is out there that the most the solid, most solid evidence for reversing child obesity is school-based programming. So us in the public health community, we can't do it without you, honestly. We need you as a partner. So if we can keep this going, you know, we've got a long ways to go there. This is where we started. This is the percentage of kids that were obese uh, at different age groups in the 70s when I was a kid versus where we are, where we got to today. That's a huge increase. And if we put that on that line, you know, We've got to get back a ways. Now, 70s, we had a different set of health risks. I was that kid you know, jumping on the big wheel off of stuff. Um, we've got to get all the way down to here. That's a long ways to go. It looks kind of daunting now when I put this is where it used to be. That's how bad we got. Um, we've actually now expanded beyond the schools. We, we're using the CLCs. We're doing things in daycares. We're doing some community marketing. We hope that we're going to lower these numbers and get about halfway there, hopefully, by, 19, by 2020. So. And then bring, I always try to bring this into a broader context. I do a lot of health system work too, and I actually almost start most of my presentations with this slide. This is a really busy slide, and almost intentionally that way. This is what all the other countries spend on healthcare. You know, Netherlands, Korea, Japan, and there's obviously this outlier here, and that's us. How much money is that? That is enough money to pay off our, an, our annual budget deficit, send all our kids to college for free, and have money left over for bridges and potholes. It's how much more we spend on healthcare. And that's a problem for schools, because who's your biggest comp competition for state funding? It's health. In Nebraska, about 42% of the budget goes to health and human services. That, the, as that keeps growing, it leads less and less money for school funding. So health is actually important for you, even in the grandest, biggest picture. Um, it's the point where, this is a quote from uh, the CEO of the Cleveland Clinic, but this is the point, it's literally an economic issue. Um, when, when Ford has to spend $1,000 more per employee because of their health care costs, it makes it really hard to compete with Honda and BMW. It's that big a deal. And, and the number of people is the scale of this. What does health, obesity cost our city of Lincoln, about 280,000 people, more than $250 million a year. That's such a big number that most of us don't even know what that number really means. <coughs> the school budget's a little bigger than that. Um, but most people don't get that. And so I try to put it in visuals. We have a new arena that we built, which is beautiful. We did this huge annual Valley project. That's one of those projects every year. And if, what, if we can take some of that money away from throwing it at, at, at BC and healthcare, you know, we could do so much more like, you know, early childhood education. That's one of our big focuses in Lincoln is to move there. That's where you can get the money from. So that's my perspective and kind of why I came at this from my side. So then we'll move to Michelle. What, how did I get here? These guys. Um, a lot of really great things had to happen before I could ever show up on scene. Now, what's very interesting, I came to this from part of Everton Hospital's environment for 10 years and saw what that whole thing looks like and, and watched people. I was a small town, I was in a town about 7,500 people when I really practiced in the hospital environment and saw the progression of people from like a, you know, a healthy active senior to hospice care. I've, I've seen the whole gamut. And then I went into corporate wellness and I really did corporate wellness development worked in medical fitness facilities for a while. And what I saw when I was doing that, I'd be out, I had about 40 different businesses that I built other wellness programming for, I worked with the team, and we would go out and do all kinds of things in, in companies. But what I would see is, you know, we as adults don't always take really good care of ourselves. 
but we'll do about anything for our kids, right? Even more so for people that are in, in the education field, because you care about kids or you wouldn't be doing what you're doing. And what we really found was, I really saw, man, if we can reach the families and reach through their kids, everyone's going to be healthier in our whole community. And so when this opportunity came up, I said, this is a way that I can impact people in a way that I can't just do if I'm out of business. It's not that I didn't love doing that, because I really kind of enjoy doing that too. But I really said, this is a place where I can impact the most people in our community. My friends say I just try to find the craziest job there is in town and take it, because that's kind of what I to do. But what I really find is, we really look at wellness. Bob talks a lot about obesity because that's our measurement tool that we use to get, frankly, dollars from government because we see that. But what you will find in everything that I do, it's kind of paying no attention to the obesity behind the curtain. It's kind of my approach because what I want us to have the people of the, that are taking our approach and going to the next level with it, I don't want them to think, oh, this is about obesity because who in this room doesn't fight the scale? If you raise your hand, people will beat you, so don't raise your hand. But who isn't struggling with, the, with this battle? Who doesn't battle every day with all the choices that we make? We all make, you know, are battling that. We have a lot on our plate. And what we, what I find is sometimes people get very skill distracted when what I was thrilled by is as we looked at our data, we really found it wasn't as much about the scale. It was going to help kids to do better in school. It was about their fitness. And the fitness piece, and be able to tie it to fitness and really message around fitness, has made our efforts much more palatable than it would have been if we would have led with the scale. Because when you lead with the scale, each of us instantly take offense because we're like, oh, well, we're kind of talking about me. I'm quite with this too. And so parents, every one of us think, even those crazy ultra marathoners, well, I could be more fit. Every one of us feels like we could be more fit. And we feel like that's achievable in little ways. And so I feel like that has been a real gateway. So you know, we talk about obesity in situations like this, but if you look at my approach with families, you do not see me talk about obesity. But guess what? What's our obesity number doing? By focusing on the rest of the kid. It's going down, right? And so you don't have to make people feel judged or labeled to be able to have them be effective. And you know, don't adjust your eyes. I'm not a size two either. But I also get the struggles of what people go through every day. And so I think that that really makes a big difference. We find that the whole child approach is the approach that makes the big difference. And when I'm thinking about it from the standpoint of the teachers I work with every day, and the nutrition services folks I work with every day, and the administrators I work with every day, you know, if I go around our administrative building and go mm -hmm. into schools, there really isn't a group I'm not working with. And I'll talk about that more in my breakout session with you. But I just really want you to recognize when we are talking about health and wellness for our kids, we're not just talking about from the standpoint of what, what's the scale say about that. We're talking about from the standpoint of how is this kid going to be successful in life? Are we thinking about them? Are they going to be healthy? Are they going to be safe? Are they going to be engaged? Are they going to be supported? And are they going to be challenged? Okay. How many of you have had a, have had a kid that has looked in your face longer than you want them to? <laughs> okay. If you think about if you think about what we want for our kids in life, at the end of all this, when they're 26 years old, what do you want life to look like for your kids? We want them to be healthy, right? We want them to be in a situation where you don't worry about their safety. We want them to be engaged in the world. We don't want them just to be engaged with their thoughts, right? We want them to be engaged. We want them to be supported in what they're doing, but we also don't want them doing their very minimum. We want them to be challenged. And what we find is if there's a misbalance of any of those pieces of the puzzle, you might have kids that are in a school that they're being loved in the school, but if they're not being challenged, they're not succeeding academically. If it's all about the academics and they don't feel loved, that doesn't work either. And so it's, it really is that balance, and that, weirdly enough, is a lot of what wellness is. It just doesn't fit in a box. It's not about necessarily what's on their tray. Yes, it is, but it's also about how do they do teaching in classrooms? How do they do all these pieces? So that's really where we work with. We look at the whole child. We really have, I have personally found, the difference maker for my friends that are principals is when, I, when we've been able to show them, wow, if these kids are moving, they're being more successful in the classroom. But you know, you know we know that pressure. We understand that pressure of, oh, these kids have to achieve, these kids have to achieve, everything's measured, everything's measured. And my friends that have, schools that have a little less poverty and my, my friends that have schools with a lot of challenges, they say, I'm so sick and tired of, of competing against my friend 
that's handed a deck that doesn't have a bunch of good blueberries in it. You know, that they have a bunch of kids that really are coming to school with problems that, that you just can't predict and that we have to really work around. And so the fact that we can help no matter, and, and Bob will show this in his dad, I think, in his breakout, but no matter where they are at economically, we find that this, this applies. And the other piece is, resources are available. What I loved when I walked in is that I saw Grab and Go Breakfast, and that I saw very similar resources to what we had. The trick is, and what I always tease about being the Match.com of resources is, Everybody wants to partner with the schools, good and bad. And so my job is to filter that because you guys know that can become a huge amount of white noise and there can be too many things. And we have a lot of initiatives. And so my feeling is I always really need to listen to what schools need and get them to the resources they need and encourage them to slow the yes on the things that are going to get in their way of being successful and having burnout. So that's a big piece of, of what I really look at is um, looking at all those pieces, really looking at things as a step at a time. And, um, you know, I, I'll talk a lot to you today, but what I really wanted to do is give you an example, and I'm hoping, you know, I want you guys to pray when you have a video. I have a video that I really want to show you, and it's from one of our elementary schools, and it tells kind of a little bit about their journey. This is a very smart principal in a very amazing school that is also a Title I school, which in our world, I don't know if that's the same in your world, but that means they have well over 50% uh, free and reduced lunch kids. This is not a school of affluence or a school of resources. This is a school of smart people engineering smart things and making things happen. And um, you'll, you'll hear from the principal, but you'll also hear from the gentleman in the video is actually a parent volunteer. And it's like, my gosh, if I could throw him on a copy machine, I would. So uh, listen to this, what's going on here. And, and this, is, this is a school that is many years down the line, and they have very strategically moved their way to where they, where they have gotten to, and they are continuing to go. So let's hope that this works. Oh, maybe it's my goal. I'm not getting the video. Okay, so we're going to go to is that we want kids to be better at school. But we, we're we looking at the whole child. We're not just looking at one part of it, like how they do on the NISA scores. We're looking at who they are as a whole child. So that's what we've tried to develop, is a, a wonderful place for our kids to be, to learn, to be active, to eat well, and uh, to know how important all of that is for their learning and their success. Neighborhoods around Prescott, they have great small parks, Hazel Label Park, 19th and A Street Park, but if you want to kick a soccer ball, if you want to come up. Research has shown is that kids that are moving, kids that are eating healthy food, kids that are getting plenty of sleep, kids that are having less screen time are better at school. And that's what our bottom line is, is that we want kids to be better at school. But we, we're looking at the whole child. We're not just looking at one part of it, like how they do on the NISA scores. We're looking at who they are as a whole child. So that's what we've tried to develop, is a, a wonderful place for our kids to be, to learn, to be active, to eat well, and uh, to know how important all of that is for their learning and their success. Neighborhoods around Prescott, they have great small parks, Hazel Label Park, 19th and A Street Park. But if you want to kick a soccer ball, if you want to come out with your family and throw the Frisbee, it's the school. The school is the park and green space. But at the beginning of the project, <coughs> the playground was just kind of a gravel desert. Uh, no one wanted to play on it. It was very hot. It was hard to run on. Okay. All right, so I'm going to keep going. Well, you know, when we really talk about how our schools, 
when we're talking about how our schools are coming along and what's happening, it's just like, how many of you guys have a school that is just on it and they're going? Right. That, that wasn't where we were. And we had a very small sampling when we very first started. And it has been a very incremental process to get schools to where they are today. And I, I'm sorry if this is fighting me because it's always during this video, but I just think it's such a better statement of what we have going on because it is so not about me. It's about me building a system that allows them to do it in a way that doesn't take them a bunch of time. Because you guys all know people that have very good intentions, but it's really getting to that place where it's more effective for their time as well. Okay, where to go? Sorry. I really do want to see this because I think it's a great statement. Research has shown is that kids that are moving, kids that are eating healthy food, kids that are getting plenty of sleep, kids that are having less screen time are better at school. And that's what our bottom line is, is that we want kids to be better at school. But we, we're looking at the whole child. We're not just looking at one part of it, like how they do on the NISA scores. We're looking at who they are as a whole child. So that's what we've tried to develop, is a, a wonderful place for our kids to be, to learn, to be active, to eat well, and uh, to know how important all of that is for their learning and their success. Neighborhoods around Prescott, they have great small parks, Hazel Abel Park, 19th and A Street Park. But if you want to kick a soccer ball, if you want to come out with your family and throw the frisbee, it's the school. The school is the park and green space. But at the beginning of the project, the playground was just kind of a gravel desert. Uh, no one wanted to play on it. It was very hot. It was hard to run on. So early on, there was a lot of consensus that, that evolved around this notion of turning the play field into something greener, something you could exercise on, something that all ages could use, something that during school and after school could use. And that was the exciting part. That really was the nugget that got a lot of people involved and a lot of people excited. That's the outdoors I feel hyped and sugary. <laughs> even, if I, even though I didn't even eat anything that's sweet. Well, this isn't a program. Wellness isn't an activity that you do once during the day. The wellness really is an attitude. When you engage people and they begin to understand that that is a value that the community shares and that the school shares and the district shares, then all programs <coughs> become transformed. People begin to think within a wellness mindset and they begin to think not just how can we do wellness and then move on, they begin to think, well, all of our programming needs to, can be involved in wellness. We can change the way we do our snacks in our after school program. We can change the way we do our lunches. We can change the way we do our activities. Instead of having a bake sale that sells cupcakes to make money, we'll have a walkathon where kids get out and walk and their parents come and walk and we celebrate what's exciting about the neighborhood and what's exciting about those activities as a fundraiser. Instead of doing after school clubs that are all just traditional clubs, do more exercise clubs, do more green and environmental clubs. I mean, you can take that wellness mindset and, be and it begins to be the basis for all the activities that you do. And that's when you have true, true transformation and that's when you see things change. Okay. Okay. So again, really our approach has been, you know, with, without Dr. Joel's support, this would not have happened. Because we needed that leadership piece. Without people on our school board being engaged, without you know, Bob and Bob's work that he's done. But then also we have been able, I have I should mention to you, you know, we've got 40,000 kids and we've got 8,000 staff and I have no budget. I am the biggest cheap date you've ever seen. These guys even saw the last time because I was even from Gary. But I, I really, I just am a cheap date because I've always understood and I really saw this especially in corporate roles and I really carried with me that when the economy tanked in 2009, that when everybody had to have everything have a shiny bow wrapped around it, when the money for the shiny bow went away, People were like, well, I'm not doing that unless it has a shiny bow. So I was really keen on building things that could run scrappy. And we had real fortunate, we have a gentleman named um, Ed Koppel, that's, that's my 
favorite sugar daddy in the world. He's the most very awesome guy. He's in his 90s. He works out like an hour and a half. He could probably take me. He's just a great guy. Um, but Ed said, you know, I really want to see this happen. He's passionate about fitness. And he said, I'm going to give the schools X amount of dollars to a foundation for five years. And I really want to see this get going. And, and the combination of uh, what Bob had to offer to be able to keep, I basically had a three-year job interview with Steve <laughs> and said, hey, they said, show us what you can do in three years and we'll see if we'll fund you. And so I worked my money out for three years and showed them we can make things happen and, and develop a lot of fundraising. So I had to be in their middle to be able to make it happen. But without leadership from our board and, and from our administration, without outside collaboration, without outside benefactors helping a little bit, you know, again, our taxpayers couldn't say, oh, well, gosh, this is eating up a bunch of money because it wasn't. And now they're seeing, wow, this is impacting other pieces. So then it makes it easier and easier to have this expand now that schools are ready. But when our schools were where you guys were, they're like, oh, one more thing. And the trick is, and, and I'll talk about this in my breakout, the smart strategy to get it to a place where it doesn't feel like one more thing, it's the, it is the fun of your school if it's well designed. And so, or it could become the Gestapo regime of uh, forced walks and, you know, no fun. And so that's to me the core of how you make it feel like you want it to feel that makes your culture shift in ways you want it to shift. And, and that to me is a real big piece. Us having data, everything that we build has <coughs> data to it, but not in like a feeling like a very uh, hamster in a study kind of way. We really build it so that our data is smart, so that it doesn't feel tricky. It's very strategic how we do things. We utilize like Field Play 60 is a huge piece. We'll talk about that. Um, but there are all kinds of different opportunities for you. And I think you'll find a lot of schools are doing little things. It's just they're kind of doing them on their own. And what I found when I started is the schools that were on the road were kind of all perfect. It was kind of a perfect cat situation. And we really just needed to get a focus and really apply the principles of marketing and branding to what we were doing. And that's really what I've been able to do and take a lot of work off their plate as we move things forward. So. Um, we do really a lot of um, quarterly challenges. And, and what I found is in schools, having things more often than quarterly was, a, was tough for them because they just have so much going on. And because everyone's school calendar is a little different, everyone's school culture is a little different. And so by building things that they could bring quarterly in the time that worked the best for them within their quarter made it a lot more powerful for them. And then that way they could really integrate things into their quarter. The, what I you know, when you start things out, you have some failures. And I would always, just, I would, that first year establish, this is the week that this is going to be happening. Well, you know how that works in school. It's like, oh, and that doesn't fit with everything else. Well, so when we loosen that up, everyone did a lot better at making things come together. But one piece that we do that no one else does that I'm, I guess I should say no one else does, but I find it to be pretty rare when I talk to people nationally, is all of our programs are integrated. We have everything for students and staff together. Now, I have a couple extra bonus things I do with staff. But what I really find is if the challenges that we do are staff and student tied, the teachers will do it for the students, and the students will do it for their teachers. And if they can compete against them all the better, but you know, that is really a huge piece. And that's the piece that I have found that, that has been missing, like when you talk from the insurance standpoint, sometimes the insurance company wants to treat schools like they're a corporation. And schools aren't a corporation. Schools are schools, and they are very different. And so we have to really think differently in how we approach wellness compared to ABC Motors down the street. We need to really recognize the power of the role modeling that happens, but not have it be framed in, in that way that it's, oh, it's all about role modeling for the kids. If it feels fun for everybody, it all happens. So um, we have a website here that I do, and we'll talk about that a little bit more in my breakout. Um, I encourage you to look at what data you have and start thinking about that as we're talking about things today. I think, gosh, what can we pull together to be able to kind of start the process really? Because you kind of have to build a baseline. And if you don't have a lot going on, great opportunity to build a baseline so you can show your growth. Because that slide wouldn't be as impressive that Bob has if it was like a spot where we were three years into the process with it. You know, we had to show where we started. And I think showing where we started really made a big difference. Um, I, this is just an example. Like some of our challenges this year, I do a lot of time to pop culture, and so we did. Um, I, we, I partnered with the Field Kids 60 as well, and they have a Field Your Community play this year. And <coughs> my kids are 12 and 14 years old, so it explains a lot of what I'm doing also. But 
Um, we did a Hunger Games challenge where we talked about personal hunger, like are you missing breakfast, how do you stay feeling full, but we talked about community hunger as well. We're doing a Brain Breaks challenge that's related to the release of Star Wars, and I brought some goodies to show you related to that in my breakout, but everything that I do is really kind of trying to tie, tie to where kids live, especially kids that aren't your slut soccer kids. The, the kids that we're really, in, that we need to engage, it's like how do you make it so that it feels fun? And we did a Minecraft challenge last year that was crazy. And, and the kids went wild with Minecraft. Well, why did I build that? Because I have kids at home making me seasick. Well, how many of you guys have watched that and said, oh my gosh, I think I'm a girl, right? But in that game, what do they have to do? They have to eat their energy and they have to go to bed. So we did a breakfast and bed challenge, and it was huge. We had over like 8,000 kids during that. So cool things that really come from that. It's like, you know, if you got 8,000 kids during and someone's really not homework, that's a miracle. So um, I had, I had, and just to kind of show growth real quick, we had last, the year prior we had 22,000 challenges come back. This year I had 29,900, just under 30,000 came back. So you can kind of see incrementally, you think, oh my gosh, isn't that the scariest thing in the world to think of having that many? But it really, it's really cool when we have people from the different schools coming together and doing a, you know, a lot of hands to make it for life work. So um, again, I'll talk a little bit more about fuel up later. Um, it feels a huge piece of what's happening. But what I encourage every school and every one of you sitting in this room is to think, what are the strengths that you have? And if you have some people that are very passionate, rock star people that kind of have that, that everybody can be included standpoint, I am not about this being about the ultramarathoner. And that's the danger that can really happen, is you get all the ultramarathoners together and they're going to be the wellness team. Well, how's that work out for you? It's a very natural fit that people think, you know, because they have very big passion and they wouldn't be doing this level of crazy with their spare time, right? But how do they how do they apply to the secretary that really has a hard time getting out? How do they apply to the kid that really just absolutely make it through recess without, you know, just being drenched in sweat? How do we get those kids engaged? And that is always my goal is I'm looking to engage the 95%. I still build it so that my ultra marathon people will want to play too. But I am always going to focus on the people that really are going to benefit the most from what we're doing. Because, you know, not everybody needs the same level of support. And we need to kind of get there. Um, but again, we also, when we talk about activity, we're looking at it from the standpoint of you can't just do break breaks and have that be the whole show. You have to have recess. You have to have physical education. Because they can't really take advantage of recess if they don't know how to kick a ball or, or have those kinds of skills. And it's bizarre, but you would, you would be amazed at what skills kids don't have, especially if they're coming from family with lower incomes. They just haven't had those resources. So um, really important to kind of get that together. And um, we really have lots of partners, and, and we'll talk about that a little bit later, but I have both usual and unusual suspects. Of course, you think of the people that we've talked about. But how many people think about the janitor is a key linchpin in your wellness program. Well, if you and I grab them breakfast and they're throwing a fit, we're, we're going to be in trouble. So uh, we have to really get them on board and work from that point. So um, I'm going to just finish here. This to me, you know, when we really talk about it, we'll talk about the whole child. Uh, Bob and C we're doing a breakout early and I'm doing a breakout later so we can kind of talk a little bit more. Make sure and save your sheets because these are going to be kind of some pieces I'm going to talk about also later. Um, and again, you're welcome to steal